Okay, now we're going to talk about more adventurous methods um, and more modern as well. And so piecewise polynomials generalize the idea of piecewise constants. So instead of having a single polynomial in X over its whole domain, you can use different polynomials in each region. Instead of different constants, fit different polynomials. So this next figure shows a piecewise polynomial in two regions. So here in the top left panel, there's a piecewise polynomial. It's a cubic polynomial. There's the knot at 50. And it's, it's a cubic to the left and a cubic to the right. They're two different cubic polynomials. And they just fit to the data. This one's fit to the data on the left. This one's fit to the data on the right. What do you think of that, Rob? Uh, there's a break in the middle, I just noticed. It's pretty ugly, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty ugly. So, but that is a piecewise cubic polynomial. But the break's ugly, so it's better to add constraints to the poly polynomials. For example, continuity. So, in this top right panel, we've got a cubic polynomial in the left, a cubic in the right, but we forced it to be continuous at the knot. So that looks much better already. This is already starting to look like the function we got from the polynomial, the a global polynomial, but we can actually see this little kink in the middle here. And in this case, it's not too egregious, but in some situations, continuity is not enough. So you can enforce continuity in, uh, on, on the derivatives as well. So this function here, this red one, is actually called a cubic spline. And what it is, is it's a cubic polynomial in the left and the right. It's continuous at the knot. The first, con first derivative is continuous at the knot, and the second derivative is continuous at the knot. So there's three constraints, and that's called a spline. Now, we couldn't make the third derivative continuous, because then it would just be a global cubic polynomial. So we've made as enough continuity as we can, still allowing some separate separate functions in a cubic in each region. That's called a cubic spline. While we're on it, you, we, we could have linear polynomials, and here's a linear spline. So it's or piecewise linear function. It's, it's linear in, in the left and the right, and it's forced to be continuous at the knot. So the amount of continuity you can enforce is one, the order of continuity is one less than the degree of the polynomial. Right? So here we can only enforce degree zero continuity, whereas here we're forcing degree two while it's a third degree polynomial. So maybe this started to be clear where we thought, thoughts evolved, right? We started off with a, with a global polynomial, and we didn't like that because it was global, right? So because the, the fit at one end would be affected by points at the other end. So then we moved to something which is more local, piecewise constants, and they were local except they're not very smooth. So now you want something that's both smooth and local. So then on the top left panel, we have something which is local. It's smooth in each panel, but it's not smooth at the knots. So now we sort of move towards a compromise where it's, 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 it's local, but it's also smooth through the, throughout the whole range. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Um, and as I said, splines have the maximum amount of continuity. Um, by the way, it's believed that a cubic spline... The discontinuity, which exists in the third derivative, is not detectable by the human eye. And it certainly seems right for my eyes. But I wouldn't trust my eyes. Okay, so let's go into a bit more detail about these splines. So we'll first do linear splines, and then we'll do cubic splines. So in the linear spline with knots at psi k, k equals 1 to capital K. So you can put down, we've had one knot in these pictures, but you can put down multiple knots. Is the definition is the piecewise linear polynomial continuous at each knot. And just like with the, in the previous cases with the global polynomials and the, and the, and the, the constant function, piecewise constant functions, you can represent this as a, we call it a linear expansion in basis functions. So transformations of the variables. Okay? In this case, what you have is you have the variable itself so one of these basis functions is just the variable itself. And then you have a collection of these um, truncated functions, basis functions. they call truncated power functions, but this one's to power 1. And it's, here it is. It's xi minus ck 
positive part. And what that means is described below here is it's equal to xi minus ck if xi is bigger than ck and it's zero otherwise. So it's not allowed to go negative. And so you make one of these functions at each of the knots and these transformations and you throw them in as, as additional variables. So to see how this works, let's look at a figure. So the blue curve is a is a just a global linear function. Here's, we've only got one knot here, so here's one of these basis functions. See, it starts off at zero at the knot, and then it goes up linearly. So this is, is x minus 0.6 positive part. Below 0.6 it's zero. So now, when you fit a linear model with, with a global linear function, plus one of these in, and each of them gets a coefficient, what you get is you get a function that's allowed to change its slope at the knot. So if you add in some mix of this to a linear function, it'll change the slope of, of this point. And so here we see it over here. Okay? And because this starts off at zero, it makes sure it's continuous here. But very handy, and you can make a bunch of these functions for however many knots you've got. Cubic splines, very similar idea. So first of all, the definition, a cubic spline with knots at CK, K going from 1 to capital K, is a piecewise cubic polynomial with continuous derivatives up to order 2 at each knot. So that's the definition of a cubic spline. Again, you can represent this as a basis expansion in the original variables. In this case, you need x1, x1, sorry, x, x squared and x cubed, so the, a basis for cubic polynomials. Of course, the constant's always in the model. Okay. And then you have similar uh, truncated power functions, but now they're raised to the power 3. One at each knot. Where this guy is defined to be xi minus ck cubed if xi is bigger than ck and zero otherwise. But the idea is the same. And here's the picture. So now here's the little basis function, this truncated power basis function, and it's a, a little cubic polynomial that's zero at, at the knot. In this figure over here, here's the global cubic polynomial, the blue one, and here's added in some little a linear combination of this orange guy, and that'll change the cubic part of the function in this region. And a bit of a detail, this basis function if you, if you check it out for yourself, you'll find out that it's, it's zero at the knot. It's also got zero first derivative and zero second derivative at the knot. So when you add it in here, you don't change the derivative, those derivatives of the function. And so it has the required continuity of a cubic spline. It's a really handy representation. Okay, so Cubic splines um, are used all over the place, and, and you'll see we, we even got fancier versions. One fancier version is, is very handy, and it's the one I tend to use all the time. It's called a natural cubic spline. If you had the choice of a cubic spline and a natural cubic spline, which one would you use, Rob? Uh, natural, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, a, that's a good choice of names. What a natural cubic spline is, it's a cubic spline where you've added two extra constraints at the boundaries. And the constraints make the function extrapolate linearly beyond the boundary knots. And what that means is that um, the ends of the, of the function aren't just left unconstrained. We saw for a global uh, cubic polynomial that the tail could wag quite a lot. Well, we're not going to let that happen here because we're going to make the function go off linearly beyond the range of the data. Okay? And so what that does is it, it adds four constraints, two on each end, and that frees up four parameters. So for the, for the same number of degrees of freedom or parameters in your model, you can, you, can, uh, you can put extra knots in the middle and get more flexibility. So in this figure, we've got a cubic spline and a, and a, a natural cubic spline. Now, you don't, in the fitted function, you don't see much difference. You see the cubic spline's a bit more wiggly at this end over here. The standard errors you see are much wider in places for the cubic spline, especially at the boundary, 
which is where the, act, the, the effect of the natural spline is, is taking place. And the standard errors for the natural spline are, are better there. I'm actually working on something called organic cubic splines, which will be even better. <laughs> I can't give you details yet. Me, but that one should catch on, I think. Especially here, here yeah. in California. Especially, especially in California. <laughs> Very good. Okay, fitting splines in R is easy. Um, there's a function BS, um, which takes a variable X and has some arguments. You can give it the knots, for example. And uh, or you, uh, there's other ways of specifying the flexibility and it'll just do the work. You, you put that in a formula and you can put one of those for what, whichever function you want to be a nonlinear and it'll just do the work for you. Did you think of the name of that function? <laughs> <laughs> I can see you don't like the name. No, no don't get rude, Rob. <laughs> um, and that's for cubic splines and for natural splines, NS. And here we see a function of age. Here's a natural cubic spline. You can see it's got three knots, interior knots, um, and it's a function of age. and gives you a very nice fit. Standard errors are included. Um, here it's done for, for the logistic regression at the same time. Okay? And for this you need to use the package splines. Okay, so there's some details, and one is knot placement, as in knot placement. So one strategy is to decide on the total number of knots, say capital K, and then, and then given that, that number, just to uh, place the knots at appropriate quantiles of the observed variable X. Okay, so just to spread them out sort of uniformly, having <coughs> roughly the same amount of data in each of the regions defined, uh, created by the knots. And when you do that, that results in a certain number of parameters. So a cubic spline with k knots turns out it's got k plus 4 parameters, or, or we call them degrees of freedom. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you use a natural spline with k knots, it only has k degrees of freedom, because you get back 2 degrees of freedom for the two constraints on each of the boundaries. And so in this figure over here, we've gone a little extreme. We've, uh, we show a comparison of a degree 14 polynomial and a natural cubic spline. And that, the natural cubic spline will have, um, yeah, will, will have uh, also 14 knots. Turns out there's 15 degrees of freedom because the constant, we, we're not counting the constants in, in these specifications over here. And, and so here we see them. Um, the, nat, uh, the natural cubic spline is, is much smoother than the, the very wiggly um, polynomial. Okay. And you can see the tail of this polynomial going crazy. So generally, I think the takeaway message is, although polynomials are easy to think of, splines are, are much better behaved and more local, and so they're the way to go, and since they're so easy to work with.